we had uh, a company called LSD do a stage set. We were going to do a big American tour. We were opening at the Maple Leaf Gardens in Canada. And uh, somebody said, anyone got an idea of what we should do as a stage set? Giza said, Stonehenge. And the guy said, well, how do you envisage this? And he said, life size. So they produced a life-size Stonehenge in uh, carbon fibre and whatever. And three uh, container loads went out with the rest of the equipment to Canada. And we, we could get about a quarter of it on stage. And we're sort of edging between these huge monoliths and whatever. Don Arden was the manager at the time. Don Arden, who I have a very soft spot for. And uh, so we get there, and it's, it's unbelievable. There's all this um, Stonehenge stuff. So we get to the point where normally, and if anyone's seen Spinal Tap, you'll recognise this, normally three or four roadies used to come on in monks' cows and the bells would chime, you know, the dong, dong. And then we go to something like War Pigs or Iron Man or whatever the opening thing was. And the, on the, on the, the last, we noticed a dwarf walking around on the day before the opening show. And what's this dwarf? Oh, never mind, never mind. So on the, the final production rehearsal in the afternoon, just doing the, the bits and pieces, this, well, this tape came on of a, a baby screaming. Now, this, this is the, the album we did was called Born Again. And the cover was um, a, a, a horrible cover. It was a, a, a newborn baby, painted red, with long yellow claws coming out of its fingernails and two little horns coming out of its head. And um, so there's this dwarf comes out and he's walking across the top of uh, this stone hinge, and there's this tape screaming, and the dwarf's miming of the screaming, and he f uh, the, the, the tape sort of fades away, and the dwarf falls back from about 35 feet in the air and falls onto this big pile of mattresses, right? And then, dong, the bells start, and the monks come out, and then, bong, and the whole thing. It's, it's pure spanta. So, uh, uh, Bev was playing, Bev Bevan was playing drums at the time. It was a peculiar year for Sabbath, and uh, we made the best of it. And we're saying to Don, we think this is in the worst possible taste, this dwarf, you know. And Don's going, no, the kids will love it, the kids will love it, you know, it'll be great. Mm, OK. So we're watching from the wings, and this dwarf comes out in a red costume with the yellow fingernails, wah, screaming, I'm looking at the kids, they're going... <laughs> really, I mean, just everyone was bursting into laughter, you know, it was absolutely horrendous. So anyway, the dwarf came out and fell off and the scream sort of tailed away, and the monks came out with their cows, dong, the bells happened. And you could still hear the screaming in the background. It wasn't the tape, it was the dwarf, because we'd taken all the mattresses away, you see. And that was the end of the dwarf. So then came the real problem, because I couldn't get into my brain any of these lyrics. I couldn't understand them. And uh, so the day before we went away, I said to my wife, I said, I, I cannot soak in these words. There's no storyline, there's no... I can't relate to what they mean. And so I, I made a cue book. I never use monitors on stage. I've never used monitors. So I made this cue book, and I, it was one of those display books and with plastic pages, and I'd written all the cue lines out, and I practised in my kitchen before I went away, turning the pages over with my foot. And uh, so I thought, well, that's going to be OK. And I had them put two wedges on the front of the stage. They weren't plugged in, but two monitor wedges to conceal the book. So after the dwarf had fallen without the mattresses and the monks came on and bang, and then all the dry ice started, bang, we're away. And I walk out, bearing in mind that Ronnie Deere was the previous singer. And it's great. The audience is fantastic, like going zerk and whatever. And I walk out, and they've got the biggest amount of dry ice I've ever seen. They must have had six buckets up there. And the dry ice is pumping out, and there's floor spots and everything else. And I suddenly... I'm going around giving it all that, you know, shaking the mic stand around and, phew, yeah. And uh, I suddenly went, oh, shit. The dry ice was sort of waist high and it's swirling towards the front of the stage and there's my book and to, I couldn't remember the first line of the first the song. I, <laughs> and so I had to fall to my knees, you know, in a sort of, in a dramatic pose, you know, and I'm going, <laughs> trying to blow the dry ice away. And I'm trying to see what the first line was. And by this time, I'm panicking so much, I don't know what the hell's going on. So I'm going, ah, da, 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 da. And all you could see was my head popping up above the dry ice and then down again to see the, <laughs> the words again. And up again. And I, I heard somebody in the front shout out, it's Ronnie Dio! <laughs> <laughs>